Welcome to Starter TV. I'm Chitra Nabat. Joining us today is Michael D. Simone, CEO of Border Free. Michael, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. You've been in the global e-commerce business for about 10 years. Before that, financial services. Right. Why did you choose to now focus on being in e-commerce? Um, well, e-commerce sort of found me uh, in my career, as it has in, I think, many professionals. It's sort of technology is disruptive, and it finds you. Uh, and um, on top of that, I'm a little bit of a geek. So I really find the intersection of business and technology to be endlessly fascinating. And so I ended up uh, in e-commerce and in international e-commerce, which I think is, uh, is a great and exciting space. You talk about being a geek. Is that what's required to be successful <laughs> in this industry? I think it helps you love it, uh, and I think loving what you do is important to being successful. Um, and so I think anybody who uh, is uh, involved in technology in one way, shape, or form, I mean, e-commerce is a lot of things, but technology is a big part of it. Um, I think it helps if you're kind of into the technology as well. You've been an executive for a long time, now CEO of Border Free. Have you had mentors or sponsors along the way? Sure, yeah. I've, um, I, I think everybody has. Actually, the, ch the chairman of our board, uh, Dan Saporin, um, has been a mentor to me now. Uh, we were talking the other day, we realized it has been almost 10 years uh, that we've known each other. Um, and he's been an important um, uh, part, I think, of the evolution, my evolution as an executive. Um, he was a CEO, um, took his company public and then sold it, and now he's a, a venture investor and sits on many boards, things like that. So he's been a terrific mentor for me. What exactly has he done for you? When you, especially when you're in the CEO role, you need someone to bounce things off of. Um, and unless someone else has been in that seat, I think it's difficult for them to really understand um, uh, what it's like to, to actually be in that seat. Um, so that's what's been great about Dan. And I think also just sort of um, coming from a big company, he, he actually worked at MasterCard and then joined a very small startup and kind of went almost through a very similar evolution that I did coming from a larger company and joining a, a, a technology startup. So um, in many ways, I feel like he sort of blazed a trail that uh, I can learn a lot from. So he sort of counseled me on many different things, leadership, dealing with investors, uh, what it's like to be public, um, strategy. I, I could go on and on, but there's quite a bit to it. You talk about being public. What is the most challenging aspect of being the CEO of a public company? I think, well, so far it's been less than a year. So what's been challenging is getting used to being public. Um, I do a lot of uh, public speaking or presentations or interviews and getting used to the idea that you have to um, sort of restrict some of the things that you talk about uh, as a private company where you don't need to be as careful and you do need to be much more careful as a public company. Really, I think that boils down to the biggest difference is that you're just under a much bigger spotlight. It's been terrific for the profile of the company uh, in terms of who we are in the industry and who we are as an organization uh, from everything from uh, selling to new customers and attracting new team members. Um, but there certainly are significant challenges to being public. When you think about e-commerce mm -hmm. and people, middle management or in the trenches working in e-commerce, what are the, the skills, the attributes required to be successful in this industry? It's a great question because really, if you think about e-commerce, it's the intersection of retail, uh, technology, as, as we talked about before. Um, there's a whole chunk of supply chain and logistics that comes into play that's really critical. Uh, and I think the best e-commerce companies are really good at those things. And so it's really the intersection of all three of those things, as well as I would say uh, it, it's driven the redefinition of what marketing is. So that's, I was going to say marketing is another important part of it. Um, but marketing has moved, I think, from a much more creative enterprise to a much more analytical enterprise. And so I think that you have that analytical marketing as, as part of the picture. Um, that is what I think pulls everything together into e-commerce. I mean, there's a lot of internet businesses that sell advertising, display, things like that, and are content driven. And I think that ad model makes sense, and I think it translates well from publishing. I think that from retail, e-commerce is quite significantly different than sort of physical commerce. Uh, it's a much more leverageable model, um, and it takes a lot more analytics. Uh, and I think, again, that, that sort of love of technology and the willingness to, to embrace it to be successful. These are pieces of what Border Free is all about. Mm -hmm. Tell us about Border Free and its strategy. Sure. Border Free really starts from the premise that all e-commerce is global. If you have a website um, and people increasingly all around the world, and in terms of that, that population has shifted massively over the past 10 years, um, can access it, they see something that they want to be able to buy from you. What if, for whatever reason, a particular product from your brand, um, they naturally assume they should be able to buy. Uh, and when we started the business back in 2008, really for American retailers, they weren't selling to people from outside the U.S. Um, for decent reasons, for good reasons. There's complexity, there's payments, there's fraud, all these things that go into the export of the product. But from the consumer perspective, I see it, I should be able to buy it. 
And we really, that's what we tapped into, was really being able to satisfy that demand that already existed by really just trying to take down the friction points between the retailer and the consumer, make it easy and low risk for the retailer, and make it elegant and trouble-free for the consumer. And that's what we're about, um, not just for now about U.S. retailers, but also expanding into the U.K. and bringing U.K. retailers onto the platform. Ultimately, e-commerce will be from anywhere to anywhere, just like offline commerce is now. It'll just be faster and more at a retail level. And I see Border Free really as being in the middle of all of that. So when you talk about being in the middle of taking the risk away for suppliers and making it more elegant for consumers, yeah. on, on a practical level, can you explain a little bit more so we could touch it, see it, understand sure, it better? Sure, absolutely. So let's start with the consumer experience. I mean, the absolute worst consumer experience is going onto a website, not being able to figure out, if you're, let's say you're in Canada, the only way you can figure out if you can buy a product from a particular retailer is actually to shop the site, put it into a shopping cart, and then try and figure out if there's a, a, a province drop down or a country drop down to figure out if you can ship the product to them. Um, and then to find out that you can't is very frustrating. Um, and that's, not, that's an inelegant experience. And so, I mean, the most basic level, any of our customers are immediately enabled to be able to satisfy that customer's desire to be able to buy a particular product. So from a, a consumer standpoint, at a basic level, uh, sort of unlocking the ability to buy is sort of the first step. But really what we've learned over the past eight years is that it's important to be able to produce as local a shopping experience as possible for that consumer. Um, another, I think, interesting example that most Americans or even North Americans don't really think that much about is the idea of tax or sales tax and VAT. Um, in most countries, VAT is embedded in the price of the item. It's not ended, uh, added at the end of the transaction like it is in the U.S. and Canada are the only two countries I'm aware that that happens, maybe Mexico too. Um, and so just not having a surprise when you get in the checkout about, oh, there's VAT added to this, why isn't it included in the price? And these are basic things that uh, go to a shopping experience that translates all this international traffic into sales as long as it's sort of an elegant experience. They don't have to think too much about how that product's going to get to them. Um, they don't have to worry about getting a phone call from customs saying, we'd like to ask you a few questions about this thing you're trying to import into our country. Things like that are all sort of taken out of the equation and out of the thought process from, from a service like Border Free. On the retailer's side of things, trying to figure out things like foreign languages, trying to figure out things like import and export regulations, how do I manage foreign payment types, fraud, all of these things are add up to a lot of complexity and risk that the retailers wouldn't normally be willing to take on, which is where Border Free really steps in and takes all that on. Um, and it's something that can be sort of leveraged across multiple different brands. We work with about 175 different uh, brands on our platform. Um, and so the benefit of that is sort of all of our experience is able to accrue individually to these brands. So they're able to sell to the consumer, again, in that way that's hopefully elegant um, and in a way that gives a, as local a shopping experience as possible. That's really what we're driving towards is delivering that local shopping experience because the goal here is to be able to convert those visitors at the same rate that an American would convert. Everything you're talking about there, to me, screams a lot of technology investment, user experience investment, and innovation across all of that. Right. So how do you stay current, and what is your innovation process across those two dimensions? We certainly have uh, uh, increased the size of our software engineering team, uh, as my CFO likes to remind me on a regular basis. I think we've quadrupled it in the past couple of years. Um, and that's almost, it's almost like you can't get enough technology into the equation. And technology has gotten uh, exponentially better and faster to deploy. And the environment keeps changing, so you have to be able to stay on top of that. And the best way to do that is really to try and hire the best and brightest people that are in that field and let them kind of go crazy on your user experience. Um, the other is really to talk to your customers, both your retailers and the consumers, and understand what about this doesn't work for you, what about this doesn't make sense for you, and then make sure that you've got that feedback loop that incorporates into your product development cycle. We look at best and breed retailers in different countries and see what they're doing differently and help our, our retailers do the same. So I think it's a, a whole process here of thinking about it from a technology standpoint and also thinking about it as much as you can understand on the ground. Um, we've, we've done last year, I think we did four consumer focus groups in different parts of the world, Singapore, South Korea, um, Canada, and maybe Australia. Uh, and when we did those, we sat down and we said, how do you shop online? What are your favorite retailers in your country? Why? What do you expect? What stops you from buying cross-border? What makes you want to buy cross-border? Understanding those things again, really understanding from their perspective what drives you to push that button and feel comfortable about the transaction and making sure that that's built into our technology. That, that's kind of been the core, I think, evolution of our platform over the past few years. Why did you pick those four locations to do this focus group? Um, because that's where a lot of our sales come from and a lot of our growth. A lot of our growth is coming out of Asia um, and understanding what's happening on the ground there is important. Um, South Korea has an enormous amount of e-commerce uh, as a percentage of retail sales. South Koreans shop online almost more than anywhere else in the world. Um, Australia was a big market for us, uh, as uh, is Canada. 
And so I think starting there and understanding um, not just where we're selling to, but also when you look at traffic on retailer websites, what countries they're coming from, those countries rate really highly. And even if it's not, if it's not converting to sales, that's almost the bigger opportunity is to say why, why, if someone's on your site. So for example, in South Korea, language is a big issue. Uh, and it's not necessarily language on a product page, it's more language in the checkout. And being able to understand if I'm about to give my payment details, that I'm understanding what field I'm putting things into, that sort of thing. So we, we arrived at those, by, I think, by market potential uh, and market size. My goal is to do the same or more this year in terms of going on site. Uh, I'm planning a trip to China in the next couple of months. I think there's a lot of interesting things happening there from an e-commerce standpoint that I think you kind of need to be in the environment to understand. Such as? Well, what's happening with Alibaba is interesting, uh, and the whole concept of selling online in China um, and in various parts of Asia where the, the marketplace concept, um, where it's not really, a, it, in the U.S. we sort of go from website to website where we shop at different places, and you might go to a Macy's or you might go to a J. Crew. Um, and in Asia, especially in Japan on Rakuten and on uh, China on uh, Tmall and Taobao, it's all sort of one, one big marketplace that kind of breaks between brands and C to C. Um, it's a marketplace environment. Uh, and understanding the differences, and that's how the Asian consumer likes to shop in a place where it's sort of, I have the entire mall at my fingertips as opposed to having to jump from website to website. And I have a single sort of search function and a single checkout function. Um, and then helping our brands understand why that's good for their business because it's a little intimidating to be in a place where everybody else is at the same time and how do you sort yourself to, to sort of stand out, how do you protect your brand, all of that. So we see that as our job of, of helping our retailers understand that um, and then helping the Chinese consumer get access to the kinds of brands they want to be able to increasingly buy from the West. How are you getting your retailers comfortable with that? I think taking the hard steps and in investing uh, in, the, in the sort of the, the try before you buy, we do that. We sort of break the ice. Um, and, and this is in a lot of different ways. It might be from uh, trialing free shipping offers to different ways of selling like on Tmall. And setting things up to help them understand how their approach would work, what makes sense, and how we would sort of ease them into it. Uh, I think the key here is helping them manage the level of risk and investment that's necessary versus the learning. Um, and so I think what we try and do is make the investment as low as possible and take as much of the risk on as we possibly can so that they can learn uh, and get more comfortable with the, that concept and in a way that works for them. Uh, and then hopefully double down in terms of that investment because they're all interested in being able to sell into these markets. They're trying to understand how, but they also need to rationalize that with who they are as a brand and who they are as a retailer. Um, and it's a learning process. I think that they need the ability to iterate. And I think where Border Free really can help is by taking on that risk um, and doing it on behalf of multiple brands, but in a way that's supportive of their brands. Uh, our brand doesn't come in front of the consumer. It's really a quiet sort of player in the transaction. So I think, it, again, it's, it's about taking the risk and the level of upfront investment down, getting them used to the concept so that they can incrementally invest as they see success. When do you think Alibaba or other platforms like that will become mainstream here in the United States? To the consumer or to the retailer as a sales platform? Both. I think the latter will happen sooner. In other words, as a sales platform for retailers, I think Alibaba is very interested in doing that. I think that's been very public. Um, we're working with them now, just as an example, with five of our retailers um, testing a product called ePass, which is a combination of, of payment and logistics that they put together that's very specific in terms of how it appeals to the account holders of Alipay in, in China. And we ran that as a test in Q4 with, uh, with big retailers like Macy's and Saks and Bloomingdale's, uh, and as well as some specialty retailers like Aeropostale and Ann Taylor. Um, so I know they're very interested in helping facilitate the connection of brands to the, to the Chinese consumer, and I think the way that they want to be able to do that is largely in the way Border Free also works, is that sort of taking that pool of consumers and that pool of brands and finding the right way to bridge it in a, in a seamless, sort of trouble-free, low-cost kind of way for the consumer. Um, so I think that opening up China to re American retail brands is something that will happen more quickly. Um, I think looking at it the other way, uh, I think that um, over time uh, that Alibaba will come up with consumer facing properties that in the U.S. Uh, either by organic growth or potentially even acquisition, I would think, um, to be able to sort of build that consumer base. I believe their aspiration is to be a global e-commerce company, not a Chinese e-commerce company. And so I think that they will find the right consumer front ends to put into the U.S. market. 
Um, they do have a, a website called AliExpress, uh, which sells tremendous amounts of uh, stuff manufactured in China, uh, but at retail um, transaction sizes, so you don't need to order 10,000 of a mm -hmm. particular shirt or something like that. And I've seen on the rankings that the U.S. is moving steadily up as uh, the number one, coming, it's not the number one, but sorry, but rising as a top destination for AliExpress orders, meaning that people are getting more and more familiar with that particular part of Alibaba Group. So I think over time that'll, the, the familiarity levels will come up. Um, I think they'll invest one way or another, either organically or, um, or through acquisition in, in, in having the brands that consumers in the U.S. are familiar with. You talked earlier about um, looking at world uh, best-in-class retailers, mm -hmm. having access to them, and bringing that know-how and that expertise to your U.S. retail clients. Mm -hmm. What are some of those trends, observations that you're bringing to the U.S. retail clients? Because one of the things challenging the U.S. retail market is lack of top-line revenue growth. Right. Um, well, certainly in the offline world. In the online world, I think they've done better, and I think they've recognized that as a, a channel that's more, much more extensible and leverageable. Um, I think, just for example, um, it's amazing when you go on an international website, one of the best examples I can give you is Zara, uh, the clothing retailer. They're headquartered in Spain. They have, I think, 90 countries that they service. They do it all themselves. They're, fan they're not a border-free customer, um, sadly. Uh, they're an awesome global retailer, and one of the most remarkable things about their site is that there's very few words. Everything's done in pictures, and the words are only like sort of the search here or this is where you put in your address type information, things that are easily translatable, that are fairly static, um, but aren't necessarily about how you describe the product. Um, and they do that because they've taken a global view, obviously, and it's much easier to communicate to people who don't speak, in their case, Spanish as their home language, um, but in English or other languages. Um, in a way that's still very, very compelling. And so they use images um, and they use iconography to, to help you understand this is where I click to pay kind of stuff. Compare that to an American retailer where the amount of copy around a product is usually quite intense. When you go to any particular retailer and you look at the product page, they invest a lot in writing a very long flowery description about the product and all of that's in English. And if you can imagine having to translate that into 25 different languages, that would be extraordinarily expensive because you can't really use a machine to describe the way um, uh, the, the color of a fabric, things like that. So that's an example, I think, of sort of how do you help uh, American retailers globalize. E-commerce is a super competitive market. How do you differentiate yourself against your competitors? Well, I think the way we started was by focusing on the international opportunity. Uh, when we looked at who the company was and who we wanted it to be and where we thought we could play a role in e-commerce, you look at the U.S. market and people were tearing themselves apart trying to get you know, that one little incremental uh, SEM optimization piece and things like that. Um, and so we really differentiated, I think, by looking at this fact that we've got this massive global opportunity. It's under-monetized um, and, and we only saw growth in the international realm because of things, trends like mobile. Um, many millions, billions potentially of people who are never going to own a desktop or a laptop can shop online because they can now with the mobile devices. So we saw that as a huge growth opportunity and it was kind of almost perplexing when you looked at the fact that the American retailer didn't sell, most of them didn't sell internationally at all and you had this huge opportunity out there. So we differentiated ourselves by focusing where nobody else was focusing, which I think is an important thing in business. There's a bunch of books, there's like the blue ocean, red ocean kind of concept, things like that. I'm not sure we actively thought of it that specifically. Um, but I think that's how you differentiate yourself at the beginning. And I think over time, we have really positioned ourselves as the expert in this space because we kind of when we started, there was nobody else in this space specifically doing what we are doing. We're also, I think, defining ourselves even further as the expert. We just um, uh, completed an acquisition of a company called Duty Calculator, um, which is maybe not anybody you've ever heard of, but is actually one of the key sources around the world for people to be able to calculate things like um, what, what kind of duty rates are on silk dresses going to China and things like that. And so they have a critical mass of data and expertise that's built into their platform that we're going to leverage into our platform. So I think it's by really trying to understand who you are in the market. Don't try and be everyone to everyone else. Uh, look for those areas of opportunity. And then when you get ahead, make sure you're investing to stay ahead. That's key because you really can't, especially in this industry, I mean, it's the industry you work in. I guess everybody would say their industries move really fast, but because technology moves so quickly and people's habits change very, very quickly, it's important, I think, to continually invest in innovation. So when you talk about investing in innovation, mm -hmm. both on the technology side as well as the, uh, the retail know-how side, mm -hmm. How are you investing to continuously have these uh, best or next practices? Well, I did mention the extreme expansion of our software engineering team, uh, and we continue to invest there. There's a few different things I think we're doing. First of all, it really does go to where, where you're hiring. You want to hire people who have got the right blend of experience. And it's extremely hard, actually, when you're in kind of a new segment or a niche 
To find someone who has the absolute right direct experience, what you really are looking for is probably somebody who's got relative experience and then can learn, which is extraordinarily important, I think, to, in terms of how we approach things. Um, but I think that the critical part of all of this, from my standpoint, um, is continually trying to think what if, right? Like I love, there's, people ask me, oh, what, what kind of people do you hire? I love people that I, when I'm talking to them at some point, they go, what if? Whatever the net comes out of their mouth next is gonna be, is gonna be great. So you have to try new things. You have to invest in things. You have to be willing to make small bets and understand some of the stuff's not gonna work out. We have some projects that we've invested in that haven't necessarily yet panned out that, that have given us a lot of learning and understanding about things like consumer behavior, uh, different ways to shop cross-border, those are areas where I think you have to be willing to experiment, um, understanding that obviously you have to pay attention to your core business performance, but at the same time, again, because things change so quickly, if you don't invest in different ideas and try some things in a little bit of an experimental way, your core business will, will keep rolling along, but eventually you'll find out the rules of the game have changed around you, and now you're no longer relevant, which is extraordinarily risky. What's the biggest problem you're trying to solve for right now in, in taking Border Free to the next level? It's building up our expertise um, in dealing with the consumer. Uh, we really have two customers in our transaction. This is the way our business works. We have the retailers, and our DNA has been very much focused on what I would call B2B mentality, where you plug into a retailer's website and you're facilitating the payments and the logistics. And as our business and our customers' business has grown, they're increasingly looking to us for levels of sophistication around what's best practice in a particular country. Um, what, are, what are the right marketing partners in those countries? Um, and, and so that's one of the reasons we did the pilot with Alipay, because I think that's the right kind of partnership for us. They've got such a great relationship with so many, literally hundreds of millions of account holders, and they've got a great brand. Uh, and then connecting that into our platform so all of our retailers are connected to it really helps us get them closer to the consumer. That's probably the most significant challenge for us over the next couple of years, is really being able to accelerate from the concept of I'm a consumer and I'm shopping cross-border to I'm shopping online and this feels local. That's what we're trying to solve for in all these different ways, innovation, partnerships, all of those things, getting closer to understanding what the consumer wants, maybe even getting in front of that and showing them that what they want or what they expect. You know, you are global, you're in 100 countries, mm -hmm. and you may not have the subject matter expertise in each of those locales. So how much of it is in-house hiring people versus external partners? So, well, we definitely tend to partner first. Um, it's uh, one of the things I, I say to my partners is don't spend all this time learning these things that we've learned over the past eight years about how U.S. retailers sell and, and things like that. And so I want to take my own advice and not try and relearn every single market out there and what's different about it, right? Working with the right partners really helps you understand that quickly. Um, but I also think that having people on the ground is important and we're increasingly investing in that. Typically we do do that through uh, agency relationships or we do it through a consulting relationship with somebody who might be a fashion ambassador, uh, somebody who writes fashion blogs in different countries and understanding um, from their perspective what's happening in the markets. As we start to get learning, as we start to get traction, then we actually hire in that market and then we have people who are actually on staff for us that are, are sort of experts in market. We're doing that increasingly in the EU. We've opened up a Dublin office. The acquisition of duty calculator put us in Brighton, just south of London. Um, we want to move on to the continent in terms of the EU uh, and also trying to look increasingly at China. China's a little trickier and partnerships work well, but you also, I think, need to have kind of sort of boots on the ground in every one of those countries at some level feeding back what's happening in that market. You talked about uh, retailers and uh, being behind the scenes, right? Mm -hmm. How do you give retail customers, whether it's Macy's, J. Crew, others, comfort that their that their brand uh, and that their public facing image is and is the integrity is going to be maintained and not uh, compromised in any way? Um, well, I think first of all, the proof is just it's visual. Um, you know, there's nothing where we say, uh, yeah, just sort of give us a product feed and we'll go sell it on our website and we'll send you the sales. But you don't get that relationship with the consumer. I think they understand over the past several years, and many of our retailers have been with us for since literally since we launched. We've really become a trusted partner in helping them. And one of the things that's been very specific, and I think one of the reasons that they like working with Border Free, is that they can enter the international market at scale in a way that is brand supportive for them. It is um, something we kind of repeat as a mantra. We have a very active client management organization who kind of goes in and talks about all the different things that um, we think that they should be doing to help improve their sales, improve their brand positioning, all of those things. But ultimately, at the end of the day, 
These retailers are the ones that own the brand proposition and own the brand promise. Um, and I think that we very solidly leave them in the position of feeling like that they're, they're completely in charge of that and actually looking to us for guidance on, you know, how do I, yes, I own the brand now, how do I navigate this particular market because, you know, for example, Google's not the top search engine, so who do I work with, that kind of thing. So I think we're seen more as a trusted partner. They certainly monitor uh, their, in, in different, some of our customers, for example, have their own Weibo pages in China. Um, and so they, they get that kind of feedback, they monitor social uh, media. Um, we have to make sure that we're being responsive because in many ways when the box gets delivered to a consumer, we're representing that brand and we want to make sure that experience was good. So we have to be extraordinarily responsive to that. You talked about helping your retailers, helping your customers internationally. You're in 100 countries. Where, what is your expansion plan for other locales and countries? We're getting very serious uh, about the UK. Um, the UK has, um, it's, it's always an interesting balance, right? Because you have to look at where are sort of the, where's the target rich environment for retailers. So the US has arguably the biggest, broadest and best selection of retailers in the world, arguably. Um, and I think when you think about e-commerce, I think you really can't argue that there's, you know, the retailers in the U.S. Uh, and online are, have been doing it longer and are, do, are bigger and, and more experienced. So starting in the U.S. made perfect sense. And then now when you look at other markets, where do you have a density of retailers? And the U.K. is excellent online retailers. Um, they also are more internationally aware, typically, than American retailers. The problems in the U.K., it's interesting, as we start talking to U.K.-based retailers, Many of them are selling internationally already. Um, so it's a little different than the US where it was sort of a turnkey, let's now go global all at once. They're already selling internationally and what they're actually finding is they're reaching a ceiling where they're either gonna have to double down on their investments um, or look to a platform like Border Free to be able to take on the complexity pieces while they invest in the brand and the building of the consumer relationships. So we're looking at the UK. Uh, we see the UK then as a bridge uh, into the EU. Um, and as you look at the EU as a block, there's tons of good retailers, but in a country by country basis, you actually have to get selective about the size of the retail that you're working with and where you put the sales effort. So that's kind of how we're looking at the next phase of expansion. When you think about um, talent, you talked about hiring uh, all of these uh, computer programmers. Mm -hmm. So is there a skill gap that you find that you run into when looking for talent? There's definitely a shortage. Um, and I know there's a lot of conversation around immigration and immigration reform uh, and education and all of these different things. But it, being in a market like New York, uh, we're also hiring, we have engineering teams in Tel Aviv and we're building an engineering team in Dublin. It's just very difficult to find people with the right skills, um, and they do tend to be transient. They tend to kind of come and work for a while at the place, and then they move on. Not really, I think, to find a better opportunity, but just to, they're curious people, and they want to go and try something else. So I think the challenge is less for, for technologists is less about skill gap than it is keeping them engaged, making them feel like they're continually sort of expanding their portfolio as, as uh, engineers, as developers. Um, and giving them continuing, like sort of increasing challenges to be able to work on. Uh, that's important, I think, from a retention standpoint, because it is, you're in a battle for talent out there, and there's a lot of really big companies like Google and Apple that are um, actively hiring in those markets, and we have to be able to compete within our niche for that. In terms of skill gaps in other parts of the organization, as I mentioned, we're in a niche, and sort of global e-commerce now, it's certainly much more talked about in common than it was when we started. Um, but trying to find people who have specific uh, skills, like some marketing skills or logistics skills, in global e-commerce, you find that you really don't. So what you have to do is hire people who can learn. They bring the right kind of experience, that form the right kind of basis, uh, and then have the ability really to expand their thinking, to think about how do I adapt what I know to sort of this different reality of crossing borders or in moving to different countries, things like that. You talk about wanting to hire people who can learn. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, build a learning organization? I think you have to focus on uh, and accept the fact that the environment around you is going to be changing continuously. And you have to figure out how you're going to invest in that. Um, some of it is formal education. Uh, we do different kinds of training for our team members. Um, we do a number of conferences. Uh, so not only attending as a marketing vehicle, but also learning by being there and understanding what's happening in the marketplace I think is important as well. Um, I also think a really important part of being a learning organization was that concept of experimenting and letting things fail as long as they fail fast without too much of an, uh, of an investment. Um, I find that you learn a tremendous amount by trying something, figuring out what works and what doesn't work, and then adjusting quickly is a fantastic way to build that sort of learning ethos into your organization by sort of learning kinesthetically, I guess, by doing, but trying those experiments and really, I think, lending yourself to a culture of innovation promotes a learning environment. Do you 
develop learning plans for your for your staff for your employees for certain areas in our staff yes um, I think as we get bigger remember we're, we're still a pretty small company we're only 235 people I think something like that um, and what I found is that as the company has when I, um, I first became the CEO we had eight people in New York City and now we have about 225 so it's a pretty dramatic difference and what I found is that the uh, your ability to communicate across the organization gets more difficult almost exponentially in relationship to the number of people that you have in the organization so building in the opportunity to learn not just formal learning sort of business skills things like that but also learning from one another so we do things like we do um, uh, I can't remember the brown bag lunches so someone will come in and and they'll have lunch in and 20 or 25 people from across the organization will come in and the person will just sit down and say, here's what I do, here's what I am, here's what I do. I know you see me every day, but here's actually what my team does, here's what we focus on. Um, so I think it's a culture of communication. Uh, I think we do focus in specifically on skills um, on the technology front. We definitely send people to formal classes and learning environments, things like that. Um, other things that we've been doing and considering, and I think we're going to do more of, uh, the online sort of free courses like Coursera and, uh, and, and promoting certain specific segments within them. So um, Code Academy here in, uh, in New York has a ton of free classes that you can take as co uh, to, to, for coding. Now, the people we hire to be developers probably that would be too simple for them, but for people who don't necessarily really have a deep technology background, it's great for them and we encourage them to do it uh, in a way that they can do it on company time. Um, and spend maybe do a couple basic classes on HTML and JavaScript. Just help people think through a little bit more about what can be done from a technology standpoint. So things like that. What do you think is the most effective learning method? Doing. Absolutely. Hands-on doing. It's probably the most expensive too. Um, but I really do think learning by doing is probably, has to be the most effective. You can't always learn that way. Uh, but I do think having that culture of innovation and experimentation lets people learn um, in, a, in a way that by doing and not being afraid that this is going to be a massive failure and actually being afraid, uh, being um, encouraged to try, uh, fail fast and, and sort of move on with what they learn to the next thing. Do you measure learning outcomes in your company? Um, I think we look, measure learning outcomes by results. Uh, and that's not just financial results, that's also retention. I think um, you know, retaining your best employees, making sure that you're developing them. Um, in order for people to be able to move up and across an organization, they have to learn. Uh, and so you have to be able to not only give them the opportunity, but they also need to prove that they've got the appetite and the aptitude to engage and to be able to learn. So I think you measure that outcome through the things that you measure in terms of your business performance, however you measure that. Um, but you also look at your, we do employee engagement surveys twice a year to understand how engaged our team is and we find that the more we invest in learning, whether it's an informal brown bag lunch or it's actually a formal interviewing, here's how to do job interviewing, um, helps people feel more engaged with the organization and brings those scores up. So those are the ways that we measure. But you know, there's a lot of companies who do employee engagement surveys. Mm -hmm. And from the employee's perspective, a lot of feedback I get from employees is, oh, the company doesn't really mean it, the CEO doesn't really mean it, mm -hmm. it's just a check the box exercise. Sure. How do you show your, your team well, it's, that- it's interesting because the engage, we get the engagement surveys and uh, after a couple of years, we kind of see some of the same comments coming in and sometimes, I mean, I do quarterly town halls with the team and I'll put it up there and say, tell me. What would make what would help here? We, yeah. we really are taking it seriously, and I, I, I get it. I, I think that there's always some element of that. But I think the the way you deal with it is you share the results honestly, uh, and you talk about your reaction to those results. Uh, I've gotten up and said, frankly, I can't understand this. So we're gonna, you know, we've we've brought in. Um, employee teams to be focus groups on ways to sort of improve communication across the organization. That's, that's a big one we get on our engagement survey. And I think it's because the organization as it grows, the things that build cross company communication in uh, sort of form over time, unless you take a formal approach to it, and the more your organization gets spread apart, the harder it is to, to, to sort of naturally assume that communication will occur. Um, so I think you take it seriously. Uh, you try and point out, this was something that came in from the engagement survey. Here's what we did about it, um, and here's your response to it. We try to measure that as well. And when we try and it doesn't work, we're honest about it. That's all you really can do. I think. I think the worst thing you can do is put an engagement survey out there, uh, give people the or any kind of survey, give people the expectation that something's going to change, and then nothing changes. So I think you need to be able to demonstrate that there has been change, or at least an effort. Some things you can't do that employees may ask you to do. I had we had employees ask if we could, if we could put treadmills in in the office, and you know there's all these different things that came with that in terms of space and in terms of other people wouldn't like the treadmills and there's insurance with all these things. So, but we at least explained why we couldn't do it um, as part of the uh, the response because we did get that kind of that kind of input. You talked earlier about finding the right people. Can you define the right people? You know, for me, it it's the people who are curious, 
uh, who use those words, those very fantastic two words, what if. Um, for me, that for our organization, in terms of where we are in the space, we're not trying to really optimize down uh, to the last sort of six sigma operational nickel. You know, the, the opportunity is to grow um, and to solve a problem that's never really been solved at scale before the way that we're doing it. So we need curious, smart, innovative people. Um, in every, basically every facet of our organization. That's the thing I think we look for more, more than anything else, really. Um, again, I can't go out and hire um, somebody who is an expert uh, in international marketing in 100 different countries. I, I, they're, they're, those people, as far as I can tell, they just, app, online, don't exist. Um, and so you have to have people who have some basis in, in understanding it um, and can take that next leap mentally. Uh, and I think the most important part really is that curiosity uh, and that sort of what, what if, what the potential for what could happen. You talked about teamwork and collaboration. How do you develop a collaborative culture? Um, it's mostly through communication. It's also, I think, every organization, you have to incent what you want to see. So if you have a particular individual who's not collaborative, but is you know, sort of out there saying, look what a great job I did, you, 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 know, you have to be careful about how you respond to that versus when a team delivers a project. Um, and focusing on things like rewarding people for teamwork. That's one of our core values. We do a, um, a quarterly uh, award uh, for each of our, our five core values. Teamwork is one of them. Um, and so we recognize people for performing in teams and acting in teams and we reward them as teams. I think that helps build a collaborative environment, giving people the right tools for communication as well. We have uh, all sorts of different um, teleconferencing ways and things of, of, we're in New York, so we're in buildings where you can't get everybody on one mm -hmm. floor. So even, you know, we were joking today, between 17 and four, we can do a video conference. We actually did it because it was easier to see each other. So I think encouraging people to interact, uh, encouraging people to collaborate, and then rewarding them for actually uh, uh, delivering something in a collaborative way over sort of the lone wolf kind of approach that, that sometimes happens. It's funny you talked about encouraging people to interact. It's amazing because it's 2015 and that's an issue. Well, it's a lot like, of people interact this way, right? They right. sit on a device and they do this and other people interact on IM and that kind of thing. And, yeah. um, you know, it's easier sometimes than, than having to get up and walk and we all have too much email. Uh, and so encouraging people to interact, um, everything from, I guess, even the layout of our floors. We have an open concept. Uh, we have offices, but we do have an open concept and people can sort of, you know, the sneaker net of walking around and talking about things even to the idea of executive town halls and having open Q&A for that and you know, not having uh, any sort of limitations on the questions that people can ask. Now, I guess there's social pressure, but I get some tough questions. <laughs> and so I think it's, it, you do need to, uh, especially I think in, in our industry, especially as you get further into technology, people can tend to be a little bit more comfortable communicating electronically. So yeah, trying to get them, encouraging them to interact more is, uh, is I think an important part of what our leadership needs to do. Leadership. What makes a good leader? I think accountability, transparency, vision combined with passion. You have to have a passion about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Um, and I think you could have someone who's a great leader if they're doing something they're passionate about who would be a terrible leader if they weren't. Um, and so I think it's, it, there's the intersection of many of those things. Are leaders born or made? Hmm. I think everybody has some level of intrinsic leadership. So I think at some level, we're all born with um, a, 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 the ability to lead. I think people like talent are born with differing amounts of that and how much is inherent versus how much can be developed. I do think that leadership uh, can be developed through, uh, by example, more than anything else, mentorship. Um, you know, the best way to become a good leader is to work for good leaders or work with them and see how they behave through a variety of circumstances. Um, but I also think that there are people who have a natural sort of, again, I think it's like talent. There are people who are really good at piano, uh, are really good cooks. Uh, I think there are people who have a high level of intrinsic leadership, naturally. Uh, and I think the key responsibilities of an organization that really wants to be able to develop its people are to find those um, aspects of anybody's personality that, and, and that, that if they want to be in a leadership role, help them develop that. Um, again, you can be extraordinarily talented at the piano, but if you don't practice the piano, you're not going to be any good at it. So I think it's a combination of what you're born with, but also what you do with it. Well, how do you lead <laughs> differently during a crisis? Um, well, you've got to take it on, head on uh, and, and not sort of uh, pretend something's not happening. It depends on the crisis. I mean, there's lots of different ways to define crisis. 
Um, and I think there's tendencies to, when something happens, to maybe kind of underreact. Uh, and I don't think you should do that. I think you should actually step up and almost, you're almost better at over communicating um, if you can. Again, it depends on what the crisis is. I think you have to lead from the front. You have to be front and center. Uh, I think that the leader has to take most of the bullets, if there's bullets to be taken, um, and take responsibility uh, for what's happened and for fixing it. If that's something, again, it depends on the crisis. Um, but I do think uh, showing that you're aware of what's going on out there, communicating that back to your team and what you think about it um, is an important part of helping people through not just crises, but difficult situations. Michael? Thank you so much for joining us today on Sardar TV. Thanks for having me. That was Michael DeSimone, CEO of Border Free. I'm Chitra Nabat with Sardar TV.